We're talking today with Jonathan Eisen. Jonathan is a professor of ecology, evolution, <laughs> microbiology, immunology, genomics, anything sure. else? I have an adjunct appointment at the Joint Genome Institute. Yeah. So, so a, a lot of different areas yeah. of expertise. Well, one of the key things that you're well known for is this idea of using genomics and bioinformatics to understand complex processes. And, and one of the real key questions is this idea of where do new functions come from in evolution? Could you tell us what you've learned? Yeah, so what I'm interested in is sort of the molecular mechanisms by which organisms invent new functions, and in particular what causes differences between organisms and how likely they are to do, to invent something. So you can call it evolvability, the sort of probability that they can invent something. And for many years I used genome sequence data to study how an organism invented something inside of its own genome, how it duplicated genes or how it changed the active site of a particular gene or genome rearrangements that led to a new operon. Uh, things like that, using genome data in conjunction with experimental information to try and understand the mechanisms by which new functions originated. And maybe in the last five to ten years, I've shifted a lot to studying how organisms steal functions from other organisms, either by gene transfer or by symbioses. So how do they acquire functions for themselves or a community without changing their own genome? With, through some interaction. Your other big area of interest is what we call the built yeah. environment. Can you tell us what that is and why the heck are you interested in it? I've always been interested in um, how you can use a controlled environment to study microbial functions or microbial diversity and I've always ended up working with like model organisms. So we study microbial communities in Drosophila melanogaster. We study microbial communities that live on corn. We study microbial communities that live with rice because we can manipulate the host. We can control the environment very readily. So I've become really, really fascinated by um, how we can manipulate environments and control them in a, in, a, in a regulated manner. And a few years ago, the Sloan Foundation started launching a few small sort of microbial studies of the ecology inside buildings. And they got very interested in this for a variety of reasons like biodefense and human health and things like that. And when I heard about this, I was fascinated because um, we live in buildings, right? We spend a lot of our time in buildings and they're also a non sort of natural environment. They're not, you know, the ocean, which I've been studying for a long time and has been around for millions of years, billions of years. Um, so buildings are really interesting because they're new in a lot of ways, very new to microbes at least. And they represent sort of a, a controlled ecosystem to study the rules by which microbial communities form and assemble. So I'm interested in them as a basic science vehicle. Other people are interested in them because that's where we live. That's where we spend all of our time. That determines probably a lot about our health and um, circulation of microbes, et cetera. So like buildings in a city or boats or planes, what is the ecology of the community of microbes inside those places? What determines why one microbe is in the window pane and another is under the sofa? Um, just the same type of questions we would ask about what determines why one is on a coral reef and one is you know, in the bottom of the hydrothermal vents. This is still a pretty new field, but do you have the beginning of answers to some of those questions? Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm actually more involved in trying to communicate information about this field. So I have a grant from the Sloan Foundation that relates to um, reaching out and communicating to members of the communities that are working on this and to the public and to the broader, what they call stakeholders. Um, we haven't done a lot of the research ourselves, but there have been a few studies in the last year, especially by Jessica Green, Noah Freer, um, Rob Knight, a few of these others that have used ribosomal RNA surveys primarily to look at microbes in showers or toilets or um, hospitals, for example. And what they're doing is basically building upon 20 years or 30 years of culture-based studies, which are wonderful but a little bit biased because we don't capture everything by the culture-based studies, and adding high-throughput sequencing to those studies. And so, for example, um, uh, Rob Knight had this paper on the, the microbiome associated with uh, toilets at UC Boulder, I think, or somewhere in Boulder, and they looked at 
whether or not you know there was uh, more similarity between the microbes in men's restrooms or women's <laughs> restrooms and where in the men's and women's restrooms there was sort of microbial diversity and it was a very serious like they they picked controlled buildings with the same structure and compared the diversity in the exact same location you know the doorknob the toilet handle the toilet seat etc so you know there've been five to ten studies that have been published in the last year and basically what I don't think there's any sort of solid conclusion um, but what they tell us is that there's an ecosystem there mm -hmm. there are niches they're not randomly scattered throughout these buildings moisture probably contact with people um, how much you wash a place etc they're gonna determine what's in the community makes good sense yeah so also okay that's this limited little box yeah. in which we live our lives yeah. but one of your other big things is open science yeah. and that ties into this whole issue of communication yeah and uh, why don't you say something about why you think open science is so critical for the future of science so there's this term open science which sort of refers to sharing uh, in scientific research scientific communication and i think actually scientists have always been open they've always wanted to share their findings with other people. They've always wanted to inspire people to look at the world around us. And socially, we have created barriers over many years that sort of modify or limit or make complicated the amount of sharing that we do. Some of them were for obvious reasons. Before email, you couldn't send someone an instant message with your new paper, right? It had to be printed somewhere. And there were journals that printed these things. And um, there were all sorts of reasons why people maybe didn't share everything they were doing in an easy manner. And what the open science movement is about, to me, is trying to leverage cheaper, newer technologies in order to accelerate the progress of science in a positive way. And that includes things like open access publishing, where it's cheap enough to publish the PDF of a paper that it doesn't really make sense to me to restrict the access to those publications. And so the more we can move towards making scientific publications not only available at no charge, but available with no restrictions. That is, you can do anything you want with that material. Much like we use GenBank for sequence data. So there's this database where people deposit DNA sequence data. And you can download that data and do anything you want with it. You can print it up and sell it on the street corner if you so think you're going to make money out of that. And that's what I think should happen to the scientific literature, is that it should be completely free. And I think the same should happen with anything that's funded by government, taxpayer funds to do research and produce scientific knowledge. We should make that material as openly available as we possibly can. And that's, to me, what open science is about. And there are many who fight this tooth and nail, whereas ASM deposits their publications in a database called PubMed Central, which is then freely available to anybody at any time of day that they can access. The new ASM journal and bio is completely openly available. So some societies have moved towards openness, um, and others have fought it. Well, we've come a long ways. In, in the yeah. PLOS journals that yeah. you've been intimately involved yeah. with were the key tipping point yeah. that started us in this direction. Thanks so much for all that yeah, you do. Yeah, sure. I really Thank appreciate you. it. It was great talking great to you. Great talking to you.